again, uh, I want to welcome all of you here, Akio and Joe Nye's uh, remarks here in the beginning, uh, that we're delighted to have so many members of the faculty uh, and to have so many Wexner Fellows here and others uh, from the community to, to join us for this occasion. It's one we've been looking forward to, and uh, we thank you, Les Wexner, for being here. Uh, <clears throat> as Joe Nye said, uh, uh, Les and Abigail Wexner uh, have become two of the most important uh, uh, supporters of the Kennedy School in the history of this institution. Uh, their support, uh, starting back uh, some 14, 15 years ago for the Wexner Fellows Program, we've had both the Israeli uh, Fellows Program and the Graduate Fellows Program uh, that have been so successful. Uh, and so many members here of the faculty have been engaged in last night. I, I, it's good to see some of them here. Brian Dell, Mandel has been deeply engaged in it. Uh, uh, and John White has been uh, deeply engaged with this. Uh, and Pete Zimmerman and Ron Heifetz and others. Uh, and then, of course, more recently, your support of the Center for Public Leadership has been something for which we've uh, been deeply grateful as well. And there are uh, others here that Mark Kellerman, especially Ron Heifetz, who was a uh, was a major figure in, 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 in marrying us up. Uh, uh, is uh, <coughs> you, we, we thank you for for that. Uh, <coughs> and as I as we said, Les, in, in inviting you here today, uh, we've had the occasion uh, since the time the center uh, opened uh, to conduct a number of uh, a, series, a number of conversations about leadership with people in both the public sector and the private sector. Uh, we've recorded those; they've become part of our archives. Uh, they uh, <coughs> are then made available to those who wish to use them in, in classrooms. Uh, they're going to become part of our website. Uh, they're, they're part of our general outreach effort and, and, and obviously a, a part of our effort to understand leadership more fully than we do. And we've had, uh, uh, we've had Nobel Peace Prize winners who have participated in this. We've former senators, prime ministers, cabinet officers, people from, non, uh, from NGOs, uh, and, uh, and, and corporate. Uh, CEOs and uh, uh, who have uh, have been here. Lou Gerstner was here uh, a few months ago when he when he completed his book and uh, uh, was was well received and I think helped people <coughs> from a school of government understand leadership from other perspectives and that's why it's, we're we're also grateful that you could uh, you could join us. <coughs> so we let let's talk for a, a little bit about that and let me introduce you a little more formally uh, to the group. Uh, and then, and then I want to ask you how you made all this possible. I mean, how you built this this company. Uh, it was some 40 years ago that uh, uh, that Les opened a single store in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, sales of $160,000 that first year. <coughs> now, limited brands is uh, some 5,000 stores altogether. Uh, in sales uh, in the year 2002, uh, some nine billion. Dollars. Not a bad growth record. <coughs> uh, and it's uh, very uh, interesting to me that even as they have undergone serious restructuring in the last two or three years, it's a heavily competitive, the retail industry is very heavily competitive. And, and, and Les has had to adjust and move his company. And Lens Lessinger was here on the faculty at the business school and has been deeply connected to the business school, to the uh, Kennedy School, uh, went to join him uh, as part of this, this effort. Uh, but even as they've gone through this restructuring, which has not been easy, uh, that Fortune recently conducted a survey of the most admired companies by field and in specialty retailing, uh, limited brands right up on top in terms of admiration. Uh, and that's an interesting story in of itself. As this company has grown, Les Wexner has increasingly devoted himself to community and philanthropy. And he's become, has become deeply woven into who he is as an individual. Uh, and when he and Abigail were married 10 years ago and she came out uh, from practicing law in New York, where she was the major law firm there, uh, she uh, came to Columbus. They've had four children since then. Mother's Day yesterday probably was a wild scramble <laughs> in the Wexer household uh, in New Albany. Uh, but uh, as, just as Les has, uh, Abigail has become deeply engaged in community commitments. She's very, very involved in the United Way. She's been 
she has uh, spent a great deal of her time now uh, working with uh, battered women and disadvantaged children and has created a, an organization in Ohio that's rapidly becoming the uh, leading children's advocacy group in the state of Ohio, and it should be been engaged in many other activities. But Abigail, why don't you stand so everybody can see you, please. <laughs> I think when Ron and Suzanne Heifetz and I went out for uh, your birthday some time ago, it was, it was really interesting to us uh, how, uh, how, how the people of Columbus had found, wow, she sort of parachuted in here, and suddenly she's the community leader organizing this and that. The United Way is like seventh or eighth biggest in the country now. Uh, it's been interesting to watch. Uh, and, and, and the person who worked with her to get a lot of this done uh, was Les. So, uh, what I'd like to do is talk for a little bit less and then open this up for conversation. We have a, a couple of cameras here we're recording it with. Uh, and I want to ask you, 40 years, how, what was the secret to building this business? How did you do it? Well, I think the, uh, my career probably has gone through about three different evolutions. Uh, initially, I, I just wanted to make a living, so opening a store uh, with the then my lifetime ambition was to be able to make fifteen thousand dollars a year and have a new car every three years. So I had a very concrete set of goals, um, and then things got screwed up, and I opened a second store, and a third, and a fourth, and a tenth, and a fortieth, and a fiftieth, and uh, the business group began to grow quite rapidly. Things got screwed up. Things got screwed up. But it was, uh, that, that first phase was, you know, probably a classic entrepreneur with a vision. Uh, and pursuing that vision uh, one store at a time, just, you know, relentlessly uh, refining and perfecting a thought. Uh, the second phase of the growth of the business was seeing if we could replicate that pattern. So becoming a multiple, a multi-division company. Uh, how many different businesses could we run uh, using the same, uh, if you would, kind of formula? So uh, it, uh, it led to creating businesses like Express, like Victoria's Secret, uh, like Bath and Body Works, and, and some other businesses. And by the early 90s, uh, what I, in hindsight, recognized that that second phase had end, ended and uh, we'd created uh, what I thought was a multi-division company, and I think really we were a, a very poorly organized venture capital company. And what I imagined for all the leaders of the businesses that comprised the business, that I wanted all of them to have the same amount of flexibility and, uh, if you would, entrepreneurial opportunities, and we reveled in that freedom. So if one business wanted to have a, a, a compact computer and another wanted to have a Dell system and somebody else wanted an IBM and somebody else didn't want any, so those were great signs of, of individuality uh, and people exercising their entrepreneurial attitudes. Uh, but the business was stalled and uh, the tough decision that I had to make in the early 90s was to uh, change the business, really uh, undertake a major change initiative, change the format, change the organization. And as I began thinking through that, what I began to realize, at, which was the hardest part, was that I'd probably have to change some of the people. And, uh, and one of the people could have been me, uh, because uh, very often as enterprises and institutions evolve, the, the founder uh, and even the, um, the mid-career person can't affect the change. And uh, we've got through it, uh, as you mentioned, you know, Len Schlesinger left the business school and uh, eventually ended up uh, in Columbus and is the vice chair of the company. And I use Len as a consultant. And, oh, I think it must have been three or four years after I began the change process, which he framed but didn't encourage. That is, he, he said, you could do this or you could do that, but if you really are serious about changing, uh, you're, the, the ripple effects will be substantial. And I thought about them, and I, one Saturday uh, I met with Len, and I said, I've decided to bite the bullet. I, I want to reorganize the business. And uh, I recognize I'm now going into the wilderness. Having built it and structured it as I wanted it to be, now I had to completely rethink it, which meant rethinking uh, the basic premises, which I think is an important leadership lesson, that you have uh, 
if you would, guiding principles, and they work for a 30-year period, I mean, screwing up very badly, opening 5,000 stores and, and creating a, a $9 billion business, and then you pause, and the, the metaphor I use is it's, it's as if uh, after 30 years, one day God taps me on the shoulder and says, well, you know, you've played professional football your whole life quite successfully, and now it's golf. <laughs> and it's, well, I wasn't planning on becoming a professional golfer. Well, it's like either that or retire. So I, I really had to think through uh, what I did personally, how, how I led the business uh, and the structure of the business. So that, that dynamic change process was quite significant. So one Saturday, I meet with Len. I tell him I'm ready to bite the bullet. He says, OK, I'll help you. He said, because this is going to be very difficult. And four or five years later, uh, I think it was over a cup of tea one night, he said, you know, he said, I was really conflicted when I gave you this direction. And he said, I spent a lot of time talking with my wife, that is his wife, Phyllis, who's also a psychologist. And he said, I was very conflicted because the probability of you leading such a change and emerging successfully, he said, I thought was one in a thousand. And I said, well, and he said, my <laughs> conflict was to tell you that you're about, you're, you, you could go off the deep end. And I said, well, why didn't you? Because I, he said, well, because you couldn't have worked harder. You couldn't have been more sincere uh, in wanting to do this. And I felt if I told you that the odds were so bad, uh, he said, I, I thought it would have just crippled you. And he said, so I just held back. And he says, like, miraculously, you were able to do it. So the summary is, I think there was an entrepreneurial phase, a, a phase of very rapid growth. Probably the greatest learning was in the reappraising. And as I, I, uh, as I told you before, uh, we end the year, last year, uh, with $9 billion in sales, uh, uh, virtually no debt, $2 billion in cash. And uh, surprisingly, uh, Fortune ranks us the most admired company in our industry. So uh, as I look back at that adventure, uh, uh, you know, we kind of lucked out. But, uh, uh, but it was a, probably the greatest learning of my life, uh, having to undo and rethink the basic principles. As a reflective practitioner, how did you make that change? What did you learn about restructuring? I mean, this comes home very closely to a lot of us here. As we look around, you had all these divisions. We have a lot of, we have a lot of centers uh, at the tennis school, and we're trying to figure out how to make the whole enterprise you know, come together in ways that are, we, can, we, we can work with each other, gain leverage with each other. How did you go through that process to, to make that work? What did you learn about that? What it took you learn? <coughs> Well, I think it uh, probably was pretty classic that, the, uh, in hindsight, it required an enormous amount of personal courage. I wouldn't have described it that way as I began, but as I look back, uh, it was iron-ass determination and courage. Uh, and uh, at some times, and I think the, the leader that has that different vision, uh, it's a very lonely world. And uh, I would meet with, if you would, my direct reports maybe they're the equivalence of, equivalency of department heads, and say, I have this new vision of what the world can be. And initially, everybody said, no, it can't be that way. And I you know, just was relentless. And then I got yes to death. So I got slow walked. Everybody said, well, if that's how you want the world to be, then we're right with you, and not a damn thing happened. And, uh, You've been there for now, right? <laughs> and so then I had to say to myself, OK, I really mean it. Now something is going to happen. And would who'd like to be the first person to walk the plank? And uh, again, at sitting around a table in a meeting, just putting it out in those words. And uh, a lot of heads went down. And sure enough, uh, there was a meeting you know, in the John, and I, somebody volunteered to walk the plank. They, they tested my, you know, I don't, I believe what you, I believe you're saying it. I believe you believe you're saying it. But I don't believe you've got the guts to fire me. That's I do. So how many, how many did you let go? Over a period of three years, probably of the top 20 leaders, two-thirds, which is classic in change management. Uh, about one-third, uh, this, this is probably 
very much uh, stuff that you know, but in any significant change, not incremental change, but quantum change, about a third of the people don't get it and don't want it. Uh, the next third get it and may not be able to accommodate the change. Uh, and the bottom third say they're willing to give it a, or the next third say they're willing to give it a try. And uh, I, I read something about change management, a couple or three books, and I said, well, I can believe that uh, there will be some fatalities, uh, but in my group, clearly, it won't be uh, a mortality of almost two-thirds. And month by month, I just, more people uh, either voluntarily or, uh, uh, but definitively, uh, either opted out or just said, you know, I can't do this, I, I can't affect this. And we began systematically repopulating the business. So the lessons are about the vision of the leader, uh, determination that the leader's willing to pay the price, uh, being clear about the vision. Hopefully in a quantum change, the, vis the vision you have is significant, improves itself, and then it's cascading that vision to one, two, five, ten people and bringing them along into that new vision. But uh, obviously everybody knows the world will change. Nobody thinks their world should change. And uh, the problem that I had probably as the dean would have or President Summers would have, it's very difficult to get eagles to fly in formation. Uh, and you know that it's that, that was, that's just how I thought about it. And you know, I'd, I'd come home regularly and, and uh, lament to Abigail. I just can't believe it. The, the merit of the idea. People are yesing me, and uh, and then they're going to the John, and uh, having meetings and and working around it, and they don't believe how serious I am. And uh, uh, I think I made the right decisions. And as a leader, there was a, a triage, if you would. Uh, that I was making because I knew I was disrupting people's lives. Uh, many of them had spent 10 or 20 years in the enterprise. Uh, as a public company, uh, not unlike public service, you have responsibility to stakeholders inside and outside the enterprise. And I had to make judgments about uh, all those stakeholders, investors, and that us not changing, I thought, would lead the enterprise to fail. And so you have individual responsibilities, friendships, uh, and I'm, uh, I, I think I'm intensely loyal uh, and, and very, very patient. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the group sorted themselves out into thirds. And uh, it, it was quite painful, but uh, uh, quite significant in terms of the outcome. Or Cash may want to come back when we get to the questions or others about this. I, I, that, that, I agree with the time. I want to shift a little because I'm, there's so many issues to cover. As you have evolved, your sense of leadership has also uh, evolved so that you now have a sense of what a, of a leader is a whole person. That goes, that's fundamental. Uh, it's interesting. This is almost a continuation of a conversation from Larry Summers' office that went on for more than an hour about what, kind, what are the qualities of good leader. Uh, that, that Larry really wanted to pursue. So uh, tell us about your, your thoughts about a, the whole person and how important that is, the whole leader. Well, I, I formulated it, and it, I think I reformulated about every couple or three years, but my, my latest thinking, and the way I talk to myself about it, is that I believe in the concept of, of the complete leader. And uh, I try to teach that, if you would, and, and uh, lobby it inside our enterprise and inside our community, whether it's uh, the American Jewish community or the Columbus community or United Way or wherever, whatever our interests are. Uh, and it's it, fundamentally, I believe, a leader has to know his stuff. Uh, so that, if you would, that's kind of the beginning because if you don't know your stuff, then you're, you're going to be a very goofy leader. But uh, uh, and I thought that when I had the first store, that I had to know my stuff, otherwise I would go broke. When I had two stores, I had to know a little bit more stuff, but I had to know that stuff, and I wanted to teach the things uh, or share the knowledge and the experience that I had with others. Uh, what I've come, of, what I've evolved my thinking to today uh, is that there's really three parts. A complete leader is a whole person, 
which is one part. I think the second part is a complete leader, is a teacher in the fullest sense. Uh, and the third part is the, the complete leader is a catalyst for change. And uh, what I mean by that, that whole person uh, is uh, at some level, I think it's very important that everybody, and we discussed this with, with Larry Summers, I think everybody should have a wholesome interest in their own career. Uh, I think everybody should have a whole life, whether it's playing golf or tennis or, um, or family and friends, so that there, there's a dimension uh, that uh, takes them out of the workaholic kind of beast of burden kind of person. Uh, I think the third part, third part uh, which began crystallizing probably about 20 years ago for me was that you have to have a sense of community. And uh, because if you think about work-life balance, you're on one continuum, which is all about you. You know, the, the, the better I do, the more golf I get to play. Uh, or the better I do, the better, uh, the better life my family can, li can live. And I think those things are healthy, but I think uh, a whole person is more trusted. And I, in the business, uh, we, we've gotten very explicit about community involvement. It's not an elective. Uh, and the community, the only part of this elective is pick, pick your interest. If it's your church, if it's your synagogue, if it's United Way, if it's your college, if it's a hospital, but you have to be significantly involved. So somebody comes and you're uh, 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 thinking about hiring them as an executive, and you talk about you know, what do you know, and then what's your life like, but you also, you, you want to talk to them about their, whether they're whole, or about their lives, and about whether they are involved in community already. Yeah. And, and this is a tough thing, because you imagine when you, you formulate this idea and say, now I'm going to interview something, it's a, um, imagine and you're recruiting a, a faculty member from Princeton or Yale, and you say, like, I really, you know your stuff, and we really value you and your compensation, psychic and otherwise. We'd like to know that you live a, a whole life and you have interests. But before you, before you come to the Kennedy School, we'd like to know what your community interests are and that you really work them, because that matters to us sincerely that you're a whole person. So imagine that in a business context, uh, uh, recruiting somebody, a senior executive from one of our competitors, and saying, well, you know, we'll match your salary, we'll increase your salary, and you know, here's the extra benefits. Uh, and uh, do you have any hobbies or you know, community interests? What do you do with your family? And then saying, uh, you know, we really value community involvement. So what do you do? And, because if you choose to come with us, you're going to have to do something, and it will be more than write a check. But you ought to think about this. So it's, it isn't, and they're not honorariums. We want you to, to really reach out in the community because we trust leaders that are whole people and that are balanced. And if you have leadership skills, you should want to exercise those skills and practice those skills at Children's Hospital. Uh, at, uh, at the Coalition for, Against Family Violence, uh, for United Way. But you have, to, you have to have that balance. And it's become a powerful recruiting tool, and I think a, a part of our reputational capital has come from uh, us uh, saying it and really doing it. Uh, when new executives begin an onboarding process, which is the uh, first of a say, couple day meetings, and this is about what we do and how we do and the history of the company, uh, we've amended uh, the previous practice and now it begins with a half day of community service. And uh, we just had a, a new onboarding for senior executives last week and uh, I spoke to them, but it was after they'd spent a half day at an alcohol and drug abuse center working with, uh, with people who were working their way back into society. And it's very powerful, because then you say, we, we really value involvement, and you must, because the first encounter with the business, you know, after, after um, uh, signing up for a paycheck, was to go out into the community and do something. So you, you guys must really mean it. When, when you had a, a dinner with, uh, with Joe, Holly, and Abigail, uh, and, and, and they had in Ohio last summer, you said that you were you had actually made a canvas of the top 250 people in your company. 
who were in the, the, the rising ranks, uh, and that you went to each one of them asking what their community involvement was, and if they weren't on a corp, uh, nonprofit board, you helped them get onto a nonprofit board. Yes. If you thought that was part of their what they had, what they needed to do as part of their growth within Limited. Yes, uh, it, it, if, if, if you say that and you really mean it, yeah. uh, because it it would be very uh, easy for people, I think, to uh, feel good about the enterprise or feel good about me as the leader, knowing that I support the Kennedy School or I support United Way. I'd say, you can't borrow that from me. You can feel good about it, but it doesn't help you. You have to do something. And uh, literally, somebody uh, in the enterprise, if you would, manages outreach for those 250. Like, what are you doing? Are you happy? What, are you, what is your interest? Do you go to the meetings? And then, you know, uh, and are you contributing? So, so it isn't an honorarium. What do you learn? And you also made the argument that it was not simply being caring about the community, but there was a, it also served the purpose of the company. Oh, yeah. it, I think it's, well, well if, if, if you're a leader, you know, if you like to organize, if you, if you like to lead, uh, you know, uh, in any capacity, then it's fun, if you would, and, uh, and it's kind of a, a self-improvement course to work these things out in other venues. So you, whether it's listening skills or how you influence a group. Uh, Bob Milborn is here, uh, who is the, the uh, professional leader of the uh, Columbus Partnership, which is a group of 16 CEOs. And the 16 CEOs picked me as the leader. So I think the, my inauguration speech was, I have no authority. You're all here voluntarily. Your interest is the community. I'm going to try to lead you, but understand I can only influence you. And I'm very sensitive to the fact that you're all presidents. Some of you are presidents of businesses larger than ours, you know, so we have a disparity of interests, but I can only lead from influence. So the, the notion of an influence model, an authority model, listening skills, organizational skills, visioning, agenda skills, the things that leaders want, you know, want to practice as, as they're uh, uh, practicing their, 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 their art, uh, and their science, I think it, it's a wonderful thing to try these things in communities, let alone your particular skill set. So if you're a marketing executive helping a hospital market, or if you're a financial executive, you know, really getting into the budget and the audit of a museum, uh, that you can apply your, if you had technical skills and your leadership and organizational abilities. And I think it makes you, it, it enriches your career and advances it. And how does it change the company itself in terms of the values within the company? Well, uh, I think when it, you know, a lot is discussed about business ethics and, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and, uh, and, and other issues of, of uh, ethics and values. Uh, at one level, if I were an investor in an enterprise, I would trust our enterprise because there's at least 250 people that are walking the walk and talking the talk and are demonstrating that they, they, can, they have ethical judgments, they have a moral compass, that they are balanced individuals. Uh, in concrete ways, uh, our business United Way campaign is on a per capita basis in New York, uh, in our offices in Kettering, Ohio, in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, and in New York City have the highest per capita giving to United Way in all of those communities. New York is an astonishing one, uh, that on a per capita basis we could uh, you know, d d do so well. Uh, and then you know, how, how the communities advance. Uh, I think the, the soft measure is uh, all leaders run the risk of making bad decisions. I mean, you, you, you know that you're not divinely inspired. And, and if you are divinely inspired, then perhaps you ignore the divine at some times and, and make human error. Uh, it's, I find it is uh, much easier for people to accept errors in judgment, mine or our collective judgments, when they know that we're coming from a position of values. That they're, they might question the judgment, but they know ethically we think things through. And uh, I think that has an enormous benefit in retention. Um, I don't think a lot of 
not nearly as much time, hopefully very little time, is wasted uh, wondering why the leaders are making decisions uh, from a values base. It's like, you know, I wonder if they've, you know, I wonder if they're good people or if, if they're selfishly motivated. I, I think there's virtually none of that in an organization. And I think that that's healthy. I also think the question comes up at, at a lot of levels of leadership, are we doing the right thing? You know, let's think about this from an ethical, moral point of view and then Final question. I'd like to open this up. Uh, the time we have. How, what What do you tell yourself about how some of our corporations have gone so badly off track here in recent years? How do we, How do we? How do you think about it? Because you're CEO of this large, very successful enterprise, and you see some of your colleagues uh, who have gone so badly wrong. Well, I think the in, the incentive. Uh, in business is, is pretty simple. You know, the, the better you do, the you run up the score, and that's measured uh, in dollars. Uh, and I think the that the the, uh, the leadership of businesses and business schools uh, would be better served by talking about ethics and morals and values, and insisting at entry level, people are asked to do the right thing, community service. Uh, and, and uh, moral judgments are, are put forward. Uh, and clearly, leaders do lead. So when there's an example of uh, somebody giving of their treasure or their time for community, and they're doing uh, those, those things are done in a thoughtful way, I think that that is healthy for the organization. Uh, I'm, I have been, before it was popular to be critical of, of businesses that gave away shareholders' money. They'd say, well, they're a wonderful company. Look at all the money they give away. And I'd say, well, wait, they're giving away the, you know, other people's money. How, how do the officers behave? Are they giving away their money? Or are they giving of their time as an enterprise? Are they really active in the community? Or have they delegated this to the community good department? And you know, so I look at, in the world as I look at it, say if, if you say you run up the score by how well you do, um, it's okay to avoid taxes, but you maybe not evade them, uh, so that you, you're, you're skating on a thin line. And there's no balance that says we think about responsibilities to our communities. So um, I, I, I don't want to make this sound holier than anyone, but in our community, as other businesses, we're very concerned about public education. And, uh, but we've uh, allowed and organized for uh, people in the business at all levels, part-timers, hourly workers, you know, senior officers, to volunteer to tutor in the Columbus public school systems. In the last two years, I think we've tutored more than 40,000 hours. So people take off time during the, during the workday and go tutor. It's like they come back enriched. The, the written messages and emails that I get, say, this is the best, if you would, benefit the company has to offer. It's better than health care. And at every level, I get messages about, you know, you do the right thing. You enable us to do the right thing. So that if they think it's better for them, their mental health. Oh, yes, their mental health. And they trust the morality. Now, I believe that at all levels, when you, you have that kind of thinking, that if somebody uh, is abusing uh, the customer, abusing the investor, uh, that somebody blows the whistle because we're we're in very practical ways and at many and as many levels as possible, walking a moral uh, walk, and we're, we're we're talking it and encouraging it and say we value it. So I I think uh, the you know. The, the, the notion of oversight, whether it's audit committees or Sarbanes-Oxley or SECs, how high you make the wall, I, I think probably enterprises, public corporations kind of deserve what they get. But I don't think they had to get, the, they had to, get to this point. I think the, the, there should have been something in business school education that says, you know, whoa, you know, be more balanced, think about this. Uh, it will be better for your business. It'll be better for society. But it's in the it's it will be 
in the enterprise's selfish interest, own selfish interest. And it was interesting because we raised this issue with President Summers and said, I know that uh, Harvard always gets sideways with either the greater Boston community about where you're going to build buildings and all these things. Think, of, think about it for a moment. What if every, every faculty member and every student had to tutor a child in the Boston public school system two hours a week? Think about the, the uh, political capital and goodwill that would be in the community for this institution or paint fences or however it's expressed, but tangible expressions. Would, would they see you as separated or would they see you partnered in the broader community interest? So I, I'd spend the money on uh, tutoring and not on lawyers. <laughs> so it's, well, we, we, invite you at, 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 uh, we invite you to come figure out how to make 10,000 eagles fly in formation. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working on 20, but... Uh, <laughs> Why don't we uh, open this up to uh, a conversation? Uh, you can identify yourself. Richard Parker, the Shorenstein Center. Um, the global uh, production of, of clothing, like textiles, has been the subject of great debate, particularly subjects like Nike's productions of shoes, uh, but it runs the gamut. Would you talk a little bit about your leadership or Limited's leadership in trying to make sure that working conditions, environmental conditions and the like are being met in the acquisition? I assume you don't operate your own plants overseas, but some companies have taken significant leadership like Levi's. Where, where is the Limited in all of this? Well, I think we're at the top of the heap. If not, we're competing to, to to, to provide the, the best moral leadership. Uh, as, as you probably well know, it's, this is a battle that, that we can't win and nobody can win in an absolute, in an absolute way. The notion of, uh, of setting standards of age, of working conditions, having inspectors uh, around the world, hundreds of people visiting factories, uh, auditing factory records, uh, to make sure that you know, power consumption equals output so that what we're seeing in the factory that's producing our merchandise isn't being uh, uh, slid in from other sites. I mean, as, as rigorous as we can be, uh, hiring third-party auditors to make sure that everything is, is to, if you would, the highest ethical standard. And I, uh, and I think we've, um, uh, we constantly uh, challenge ourselves, say, you know, is there more that we could do? And occasionally we figure out more and better ways, but it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult, very difficult thing, as you can imagine. Uh, when the needle skills, things that produce shoes and apparel, uh, your, those, those jobs and those industries, you know, migrate to uh, places where uh, wages are low, uh, cultural differences are quite substantial than ours. But we, we build that wall as high as we can. Did you have a follow-up, Richard? Uh, I was just hoping that for some examples, because I know it's a field where uh, there have been debates about the means of enforcement, the criteria for enforcement, whether it should be voluntary within the industry, whether outsiders, including states or NGOs, should become involved as the auditors of the process. And I was interested just a little more to hear your thoughts and perhaps some examples of criteria. Are there certain countries that you won't uh, acquire goods from because of human rights policies? How do you develop those policies? Just trying to get some flesh on this. Yeah, yeah. We, we do that. We, we've also, in a positive way, uh, tried to provide leadership for sub-Sahara sub Africa, uh, teaching skills, how to run factories, factory standards, uh, ask entrepreneurs and factory owners from other countries to go there and, and show, uh, take entrepreneurs and factory owners from sub-Saharan Africa, show them factories that meet standards, how they can run, uh, practical things. Yeah. So we're, we're tough about it. got a new insight on the world, and then, of course, they had to have the courage and the leadership 
ability to, to follow through on that. What was it about the retail world um, 10, 11, 12 years ago, whenever you realized that you had to change? What was it that you realized had changed that meant that you had to lead your company in a different way, even if that meant maybe not even with you? What, what, was, what was the change in your world? Well, the, the, the retail wheel is, is always turning, and uh, I, I think uh, there have been changes in the last 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. I think the most significant part was the internal piece. It wasn't competitive. Uh, the most significant piece was recognizing that we had organized. I had created a business and set an organizational structure that was not functional and that it, it did function very successfully for about a decade uh, and that I had to challenge that. Uh, the, the environmental piece that happened was important, but not that important. And 20 years ago, uh, uh, fashion specialty businesses could be stores, and clearly there was a shift to brands where the most successful stores were, were perceived of as brands, whether they were created by designers or created by retailers. And that, that was a, in parallel. But, but the significant part was just rethinking the organization that I'd structured as a leader. Great. Uh, Dean Williams from the Center for Public Leadership. Uh, what's the most significant leadership challenge you're facing right now, given the growth of the company, the success of the company, and the direction it could be heading? What is it that keeps you up at night that you're wrestling with right now? Well, at this point in my young life, I wonder of how I've really done in terms of, you know, is the, the success of the enterprise uh, a function of me or have we created a culture and a pattern and, and ideas that, that go beyond a generation? Uh, within that, what I began thinking about uh, probably about five years ago was I, I like to teach, but the way I was taught was kind of as, a, uh, as an apprentice watching a master, just obs observing how others had worked. And what I began to think about and have made some progress with is, thus comes part of, part of the, my, my leadership model is that leaders have to be teachers. And uh, the aspects of it, like, I think good teachers do know their subject. Uh, good teachers care about their students. Uh, the students know the teacher does care. The teacher has a teachable point of view and does teach. So I, I've not been trained as a teacher, but I've been coached recently in about teaching. So to develop lesson plans, uh, I budget about uh, 150 hours a year of teaching. Not watch me do, but classes of three, six, ten, twelve people. Uh, generally, uh, two to three hour classes, homework, and and what it's forced me to do is to think about what I do from a teachable point of view. Uh, the way I'd thought about it was, you know, like I, I, I'm a tennis pro and I really hit the ball well. Just watch me. Very different to break that down and be able to actually teach somebody, and. Uh, we, we've, uh, there's a couple teachers, if you would, in the enterprise that are coaching me to see myself as a teacher. So I, th I think the challenge is sustainability. Uh, there's a question of the structure, if you would, the architecture of the business. Uh, but I think the challenge that I have is thinking about things in teachable points of view, uh, demonstrating that I can, and then teaching others to teach, which, which in a business atmosphere is quite different. Let me go over this again. <laughs> you as chairman of the company spent 100 to 150 hours teaching others, mostly within your company. You know, our academic dean, Steve Walt, will probably give you fully 100 points here within the Kennedy School. For the responsibility of a faculty member to do that much, you actually spent 100, 150 hours of your own time teaching who? People who work for you, executives coming up, people outside the company. And what do you teach? Well, I, I begin uh, with uh, high potentials. Uh, I teach uh, leadership. 
I teach merchandising, I teach marketing, things that I think I know about. Uh, the, uh, the divisional presidents and other leaders suggest people for class, if you would, graduate students. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of time, uh, say it's nominally three or four hours a week, uh, but there's probably another equal amount of time in the preparation because one of the things I learned about teaching is I can ramble for an hour, but having a lesson plan and really getting to a teachable point of view, what is the essence of it? This is what I'm going to teach you. Let me break it down for you. Let me give you a case study. Uh, let me give you homework to see. I mean, it's real, real teaching, not just trying to communicate, but uh, I, I did not go to teaching school. Uh, and it's, uh, but I really do do it. I, I, I'm a, so I'm a big evangelist of leaders have to see themselves as teachers, not just be not just with the willingness to share, but again, teachable points of view. And it's, uh, as, again, as a, a novice practitioner, it's petrifying. Uh, because just to say, well, talk to people about how to buy sweaters or talk to people about uh, leadership or values-based leadership, uh, that's kind of easy. You say, now put it, make a lesson plan for this and think about how you're going to interact and you're going to teach and ask questions and give people homework and they're going to come back and uh, very interesting revelation and I think it levers me because again a, a successful leader only gets leveraged by the scope and scale that he can influence others so if, if you can only learn what I do by watching and then interpreting it uh, I, I think I had a I did not have a teaching model so I'm, I'm uh, quite challenged uh, by thinking about it really as a teacher in, in the fullest sense of the, at least the full sense to me. The, 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 one of the students has a question. <laughs> Les, you once uh, mentioned that uh, leadership in a basketball team was a metaphor that was, you found useful. In what ways does running a large organization, uh, in what ways is that analogous to leadership in a basketball team? Well, when you, what I found myself in the, in the business uh, answering the dean's question about leadership, uh, I, I like to think in, uh, and, and communicate in analogies. So we'd say, you know, we, have to, we win together, this is like a team, and, and we have to really function like a team, and we have to have a great team effort. And everybody would say yes. I mean, this for years people would say yes, because it's kind of an inspiring thing to imagine a team and, you know, who, if you, whatever coach was popular or, or team was winning and say we can be a team and we can win like this or we could we could win like Michael Jordan and and the uh, in Chicago or we could win like the Green Bay Packers and I what I recognize that there's different kinds of teams and so a football team which if that's the way you think about teaming uh, the quarterback calls all the plays handles the ball every time and people have very specific assignments uh, you know, a baseball team is substantially the same. A basketball team is different. There's a playmaker. It moves much faster, and everybody handles the ball. And the model that, 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 uh, that I've, uh, I evangelize in our enterprise, because I think it matches the, the, uh, the business we're in, the fashion business moves very fast. And a lot of people have to make decisions. Uh, and we have to team up and we have to partner up, you know, and there is a coach, there is a playmaker, there are defined positions, if you would, responsibilities, but I'd like people to see it as a basketball team, that fast moving, that interactive, then anyone can score. So I think it's useful in our enterprise when we talk about teaming to uh, be specific about what we're referencing. And we've actually made a, a a movie where we've used some swipes from the NBA to demonstrate speed and agility and the fact that anybody can score. And then you show that next to clips from a baseball where it's, you know, painfully slow. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the catcher's going out to the mound to get the signal and then goes back and gets the signal again. It doesn't resemble basketball at all. But that's my, my mental model for team. We're going to be closing up, please. Hi, uh, I'm Sasha Littman. I'm one of your graduate fellows, so thank you for the investment. Um, I'm finishing my degree right now in, uh, here at the uh, Kennedy School. 
And I had a question for you regarding um, some of your involvement with the Jewish community specifically, and was wondering, with the organized Jewish community, what kind of changes do you see the organized Jewish community needing to go through in the next several years, um, paralleling your experiences with uh, in your business life? Well, I think the um, I've thought about that a lot, and the the American Jewish community was very much organized on a model uh, that responded to the tragedies. Uh, of the Holocaust and World War II. So it was, a, it was largely organized about r rescue and resettlement, support and establishment of the State of Israel. And, those were, and, and it was led largely uh, by marketers, if you would, guys like me that could raise money and organize fundraising because that was the priority. And uh, I think it is struggling because it doesn't have a vision that's relevant into the future. So that, that, that vision, which was very powerful in 1948, 58, 68, and 78, uh, is le becomes less relevant in 2008. Um, in, in 2048, it'll be 100 years old. So uh, what, I, what I tell um, my friends in the, that, that worry about Jewish community life is that uh, the relevance of the Holocaust in World War II as the issue that, that catalyzes and, and uh, uh, coalesces the action of the community is about the same relevance to my kids as the American Civil War was to me. It's just something that was long in the past, and it doesn't really express current problems. And what, uh, in the theory of change, I think the community has to come together and have a compelling vision of the future. So, and it, Fixing things that are broken or dysfunctional isn't nearly, uh, isn't, is probably a worthwhile thing because broken things need to be fixed. But getting bright people together and say, what is the vision of the community go forward? You know, is it about outreach? Uh, is it about education? Uh, is it about community institutions? Is, it, is, it a, is there a different balance uh, between support for Israel and uh, support for American Jewish institutions or other world institutions. And I've been trying to lead that argument uh, or lead that discussion and get people engaged that just going back to the 1968 model and, and trying to relive it and repair it uh, will be chaotic. So, uh, I mean, I have very specific ideas about what that vision should be, but, but I think it re Again, you've got to get the eagles to fly in formation and really say, do we have a problem? Do we need to change? Is there a, is there a clear vision of the future? Uh, and I've, I've had, I've had uh, mixed results in people engaging uh, because when you begin a change process, uh, the first thing that happens is people say, what the hell's the problem? You know, it's, you know, we're not doing as well as we used to, but there's no real need for change. What we got to do is just fix a few things and get them back to the way they were. I, I, but I think, that demon, I think it's a, a good question and that it demonstrates how I think about leaders' roles. And uh, I, I think, the, again, the, the, the essence of it is, is a clear and compelling vision. And, and repair isn't compelling. And it, it just doesn't move men's and women's souls. Thank you, David. Les, thank you, uh, Dean. Uh, thank you. I want to say uh, we're grateful to you today, not only for uh, coming and speaking here, uh, and we'll look to, forward to a continuing conversation as your evolve, as views continue to evolve. Um, but I want to say to you personally that uh, how grateful I am that all of us here are at school that, and partnering with the Kennedy School, you're bringing to us not only financial support, uh, but we welcome the fact that you are as committed to be engaged with the process or the growth uh, of, of, of the enterprises here uh, that you bring to it a very deeply anchored set of, of, of belief in, 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 in values-based leadership uh, and that you bring to it a moral compass. I think that from our perspective to have you with us as a partner with the kind of values you represent, and you and Abigail represent, it, it just makes our effort here so much, uh, uh, I think, more satisfying and, and uh, allows us to have a sense of real growth, possibly. So we thank, thank you for that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.